Welcome to Inside Admission, the podcast that gives you a behind-the-scenes look at the college admission process with the experts in and around college admission. Hi, everyone. This is Andy Palumbo with Inside Admission, uh, and I'm very excited to introduce um, my guest today, Aaron Ray, who's the Director of Opportunity Programs at Hamilton College uh, in New York. Uh, so, Aaron, uh, welcome to the podcast, and um, why don't you start off by introducing yourself, telling us a little bit about your, your current role, your institution, and you know, just explain your job in your own words. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, Aaron Ray, I use he, him, his pronouns. Uh, as Andy said, I am Director of Opportunity Programs at Hamilton College. Um, opportunity Programs, it's, it's a something that was started in 1969 in New York State uh, from Arthur O. Eve, who was a, a deputy uh, state Senate speaker, assembly speaker. And it's, it's a college success program, right? So it's, it's for students who are from historically underserved backgrounds, lower socioeconomic backgrounds, um, who, you know, show great promise, but maybe don't hit all of the admissions criteria for a particular institution. So um, we provide holistic support from academic advising, academic tutoring, social programming, um, advocacy work, and, and helping students to, to ensure that they're successful. So um, my favorite part of the job is I get to work directly with students from the time they're in high school all the way through until after graduation. I don't think there's many jobs out there where you get to do that. Um, so it's something I've, I've been doing. This is my going on seventh year working in opportunity programs, um, but my 12th year overall working in higher ed. That's great. And what were you doing before uh, opportunity programs, Aaron? Yeah, so I, I worked in admissions uh, at Union College, uh, which is also both of our alma mater. Um, I was assistant dean of admissions and was also the coordinator for multicultural recruitment. That's great. Thanks for sharing. So, uh, you know, this podcast, part of the goal is just to show the, the human side, show that we're not, you know, robots or computer algorithms uh, making these decisions in the admissions process. So um, really interested uh, to hear a bit about your journey to college. Uh, what was your search like? What were the things that mattered to you? And and, you know, how did you how did you navigate the process? Yeah, sure. So my, my college search was horrible. Um, so for all the, all the, all the parents out there that are, uh, worried about their child, not being really into the college search process, have faith. It'll, it'll hopefully work out in the end. Um, I grew up always knowing I was going to go to college. Um, uh, my, my parents really, uh, embedded that even though they didn't, um, they always sort of I guess Fallon told me that I was going to, to go to college. I, um, but I, I had a. I had a school counselor that essentially laughed in my face when I told her I wanted to be a veterinarian. And while she wasn't wrong, because I am not a veterinarian, um, the way she went about it was really harmful. And it, it really turned me off on the entire process. Um, so I, I didn't visit many colleges at all. I, I changed my intended major to zoology. And uh, I don't know you know, Andy, how many schools in New York State have zoology, but at the time it was one. Shout out to SUNY Oswego. So that was the school I went to visit with my mom and it was fine. It, you know, they had a new dorm, they had a nice dining hall. So I was like, yeah, I, I can do this. I think I applied early action or I was admitted relatively quickly. Um, but I, I was actually recruited to play football. Um, and football, I, I actually dislike the sport of football. Go Giants. But um I, I was we're going to edit that part out. <laughs> I was recruited by some of the local colleges, Union, and then that other school across the river. And and being recruited blew up my ego. Like, even though I didn't want to play, I never thought about playing football in college. I was a basketball player. I'm still a basketball player in my heart, um, despite what my ankles say. And had it not been for a freak injury on the last day of football in my senior year, I probably would have gotten a few looks. Um, but I was recruited to play football. It felt pretty good to be recruited. I did a visit on like the coldest day of the year, walking by the Knott Memorial with that wind tunnel was brutal. Uh, but I did an overnight and I was impressed with what I experienced and I ended up applying early decision. Um, and thanks to Taran Tadal, shout out to Taran. I was admitted through early decision two into the opportunity programs at Union College. 
That's great. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, so, uh, you know, when we were talking about doing this podcast, um, and you were the, the brave soul to be first, uh, you know, we talked about a whole range of topics that, that I plan on covering on the show and you opted to talk about the, the summer before college that, that transition to college. And I'm just curious, what was it about that piece that, uh, that made you want to talk about that? Yeah. So I think it's because it's a topic that's not talked about enough in our in our profession, but just in the college process in general, right? Everything's about finding the right fit and how to apply and get admitted. And then once you're admitted, how to find the right fit again. It's like this cat and mouse game. And then it's like, then you're in college. Like there's this huge gap in the summer months, really from like May 2nd until classes start of just like, this sort of no man's land, right? Like you no longer have your college counselor or the person that, that helped you through that process kind of working with you because it's summer and they're not working anymore. Um, and every college has a different process. Some colleges have summer orientations. That, some, some orientations happen before high school ends in New York. Like it's, it's, it's wild. Um, so every college has a different approach. And so much happens from May 2nd until classes start in August or September. Um, a lot of things can go wrong and a lot of things can also go right. So don't be scared. Um, but it, it really being on the higher ed side, I kind of I've seen students come in and be completely lost and not know what to do. Um, and at Hamilton, we have this Alex advising program. So we've been really intentional about about supporting students and even with this intentional support these these advisors who like every student has access to we still had students sort of falling through the crack at a really small school and i think part of that is they they just don't know what to expect right college is so different from high school high school is very controlled you go from this class to that class to this class and 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 there's rules and there's there's hall monitors, right? And college, while there's rules, like it is, it is a, a new sort of, of freedom and, and there's new vocabulary, a bursar. I didn't know what a bursar was until the Hamilton musical came out and I decided to Google it. I was like, oh, that's who I was always late in paying as an undergrad, right? Like there's the, like the, 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 the registrar, like what? Oh, the person that I go to to change my <laughs> class. Like there's so much like old school language embedded in the college process. So yeah, especially for first gen students, it's intimidating. And a lot of the the information that colleges send has gone from being mail-based to email and portal-based. I mean, what do we know about students? They do not read email and they do not read email well. Um, so I think there's there's information getting getting lost out there that could be really beneficial to students. So I felt like this this is something that I, I sort of know well just with my my role in higher ed and and I figured, you know, maybe not a lot of other people would wanna wanna talk about it. Well, thanks, Aaron. I, I think you're probably the the perfect person to talk about this. So um you know, I, I think uh sort of picking up off what you just shared, you know, let let's imagine I'm the parent of a first gen student and so much of the focus has been on the application deadline and then on the deposit deadline. And it's May 2nd. We, we made the deposit last night. We feel good about it. We have a financial aid package that we think we can, we can make happen. But now as a parent, I'm realizing I don't know what comes next. Uh, you know, what, what, what does that look like? Where, where do I go to? What are the resources at my disposal to, to help my student? Um, and, and to what level should I be helping them? What should they be doing? What should I be doing as a parent to, to help them with that transition to college? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the million dollar question. I think every parent wants to, to know the answer to, and, and a common theme throughout this, this podcast is going to be, well, it really depends. Um, but you as a parent, you know, your child best, you know, if your child is an overachiever, if your child is a typical teenage male who, you know, doesn't really get things together until they're in their thirties. It, it, it ranges. Right. Um, but for most families, your communication with colleges at, at this point in time is, is kind of over. Not to say that you can't pick up the phone and call and get some questions answered, but because of FERPA and even without FERPA, all the college's communication, all the important communication is going to the student. 
the bill is going to the student. Even though the parents are typically the ones paying, the bill goes to the student. Um, and again, it, it's going to the email and it's going to the portal. Um, so I'm not recommending that parents hack their child's email. Um, <laughs> I don't recommend that at all. And even if you were the one who filled out the application and put your own email. We see that sometimes. Um, all no. the important information will go <laughs> will go to their college email. Um, so so unless your child's like, here's my password, like they're the only ones who are going to have that information. So my first advice is to sit down with your child and have an open conversation about what your communication about college is going to be like. Set some ground rules. Right. Um, and that's going to look different for every family. Some parents are like, I pay the bill so I get to have everything. I probably why well, I don't disagree. Right. <laughs> like my, I have a three year old or she'll be three in two days. And I'm like until you start paying some bills around here, go to timeout. Um, so, but you have to lay some ground rules to have an open line of communication because they're sort of the 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 gatekeeper of all the information for the college. So you want to you want them to trust you and they want to be trusted by you. Um, every, pretty much every college or institution has some sort of first year experience office or department also referred to as FYE also colleges, a lot of acronyms. So, so get used to that. So the FYE office is usually in charge of orientation, pre-orientation. That's the department that is reaching out to your child from the time they deposit until the time that orientation is uh, oftentimes over. Um, so that is usually the primary go-to resource for students and parents. There will be some information shared with parents, like if they have programming during orientation for parents. Um, sometimes there are sort of meetups for incoming students and families are invited to that. So there will be information about family weekend in the fall. That's the information that parents can expect. Um, but in terms of like the residence hall, what, what, what items they need, the bookstore will send that bookstore will usually send that to parents. They'll be like, Oh yeah, here's all the expensive things that your child needs. And I would say, look on Reddit or any other college confidential website to see what your students actually need. Because at the end of the year, so much stuff is wasted because it just, it wasn't needed, but corporate America knows how to pull the strings of parents' hearts. Um, but I think I think the, the best thing you can do is really establish that open line of communication, stay on them about making sure they're reading their email and meeting important deadlines. There's a lot of important deadlines from um, housing selection to uh, getting your courses selected to registering for pre-orientation. If you miss those deadlines, there's there's repercussions to that. So empowering your student to take ownership in that um, is, a, is a vital port, important step to them taking ownership of their college experience. So so what are some of the the academic things students might have to do over the summer to to get prepared uh, for college, whether it's taking classes or any sort of placement test? Uh, what what can students yeah. expect generally? Yeah. So again, that's going to vary depending on the institution. Um, I know some schools will require students to take some sort of placement for math and chemistry. Others will have sort of a writing expository writing assignment that'll help them be placed into a writing course. Um, if students are interested in taking languages, they'll have to take placements. So, so that's really important. Um, some students will be able to transfer in AP credits or IB credits. So it'll be important that when they get those scores that they send them to the registrar's office. And if students don't know what the registrar's office is, they can Google it. Um, and I think that my advice to students on how to like really prepare themselves for uh, their, the academics of, of college is not necessarily like taking summer classes or reading a bunch of books. My advice is establish a solid sleeping pattern, right? Like I get it. The summer after high school, there's graduation parties. I'm an adult now. I have my license. A lot of students, I have my license. Like you can't tell me what to do. And they stay out to the wee hours of the morning and sleep all day. And like, while yes, your, your college schedule is nothing like your high school schedule, you still want to have healthy sleeping patterns um, established before you get to college. Because with stress and with anxiety of exams and that kind of stuff, like it's going to 
grind away a little bit, but if you have a solid, healthy sleeping pattern um, to start with, you're more likely to have success in keeping that up throughout the first semester. That is, that's something no one told, told me, Andy, I don't know if anyone told you that uh, for your first semester of college. Um, but, but that is, I am, I am preaching that to all of our students as they're, they're coming in. Yeah. I think my, my parents told me that, which is probably why I didn't listen to it. So parents, if you're listening, uh, find someone that your student will actually listen to and have them give that same advice. Uh, because that was, uh, you know, our our fellow, uh, union college colleague and, and mentor, Matt Millis, that he was, he was that for me, keeping me on the straight and narrow, making, making sure I got my sleep. It was, so, uh, it was Lorraine Cox for me, Lorraine Cox. <laughs> so, um, it, you know, as we think about the, the the social preparedness, I think one of the things that happens over the summer is, you know, you have students often are, are separating from their long term friends. They're even, you know, the most uh, outgoing students tend to have a little bit of anxiety about starting fresh, starting, uh, you know, in a new school. For some students, it's it's an exciting opportunity. But again, it can be pretty overwhelming. So during the summer, what are some things that students can can do to prepare themselves to engage um, socially within their new community? Another great question, man. Um, so one, I think it's really important for them to sort of leave their their home on solid ground right like so you're if you're leaving if you're going to college further away you're not going to be able to come home other than like winter break in the summers um you know have spend some time with family grandparents aunts and uncles cousins your friends from high school because once you go to college like things will never be the same even if you move home after college even if you live close to home never move out of that neighborhood um things will will never be the same. Um, so I think it's really important to like make some lasting memories um, with your loved ones, with your friends, because like I said, think things will change. For students going to college who are maybe nervous about transitioning socially or or just, you know, it, we've been in a global pandemic for now what feels like forever. Um, our friendships have been built over social media for, for the last 20 months. Um, my advice is to try to try to build some relationships with your incoming classmates outside of social media, um, which is not easy, right? Because everyone, you know, they invite you to the the class Facebook group and the Instagram page and TikTok and and God, I sound old talking like this, but um, you do. Yeah, I do. I, I'm 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 embracing it. I'm not wearing white white New Balance shoes just yet, but I am embracing <laughs> being a dad. Uh, but no, like really like cool. You connect with people on social media, but like then have a phone conversation, like talk on zoom or Google hangout, like have as much face to face interaction as possible. Um, and, and do that in the, in the summer so that when you arrive to campus, whether it's orientation or whatnot, like you have some familiar faces that you can go, doesn't mean that they're going to be your best friends throughout college. Like you're going to have relationships come and go and, and joyous times and not so joyous times that's going to happen but at at the beginning i think it's really important to have some face-to-face conversation if you have people from your local area that are going to the college or you live in a larger city you can find other people that are going to college meet them in person hang out if if the college is having like a uh a welcome event in or close to a city that that you live in or, or you live close to that city take advantage of those opportunities because those are typically smaller settings. So you can meet a few people um, without all 500 or 5,000 incoming first year students uh, arriving all at the same time during, during orientation. Um, If the college offers a pre-orientation, that is something that one you're interested in and two is affordable for you. I do recommend it because I think that provides you another small setting where you can get to know other people um before everyone else arrives but don't feel forced to like if you're not an outdoors person camping person and you have no interest in going camping and they're like yeah we're going camping for pre-orientation like you don't have to put yourself in the woods uh oftentimes colleges have like volunteer ones and and more artistically based ones so 
typically college in this day and age, I think, are coming up with different ways for students to, to get connected before they arrive to campus. Um, but don't don't feel like you have to. So, uh, you know, before we talk about, you know, that that first day, that first week, first semester on campus, um, something we haven't touched on yet is is bridge programs. And so, uh, you know, I know a lot of opportunity programs um, operate with a bridge program. Some schools have their own bridge programs. Can you talk a little bit about what a bridge program is and what some of the goals are and and what that experience is like for for students. Yeah, absolutely. So bridge programs are exactly how they sound. It bridges you between high school and, and college. And, and think about it as sort of an onboarding to college. I think historically, back in the day, they were looked at as sort of a boot camp. Um, I think a lot of uh, higher ed institutions are moving away from that sort of boot camp mentality and moving more towards an onboarding experience. Um, like I said at the beginning, it's a huge jump from high school to college. And so these bridge programs help students get acclimated to sort of that that jump in rigor jump in expectations what it's like to be learning from a college professor instead of a a uh, high school teacher um how to manage your time navigating campus navigating the resources a lot of the bridge programs are typically for first gen students um or students who you know just their their parents didn't have the opportunity to go to college but not necessarily. I know that there are bridge programs for women in STEM at certain institutions. So there's all different types of opportunities. Um, some are paid, some aren't paid. Like for ours, students don't have to pay anything. Um, if a student is invited to participate in a bridge program and it's feasible, um, highly recommend it. A lot of them are mandatory. It's like you have to do this or you're not coming, which sounds rough, but it, it just it's it. Students who go through these programs tend to uh, retain at a higher percentage and they graduate at a higher percentage. And I think it's something that if colleges could afford it, they would do it for everybody because it, it, it's proven to work, but it is a, a big investment by the institution. We spend a lot of money on our summer program, but our students do graduate at a higher rate than, than the rest of the institution. So they, they do work. It, it can be scary to send your kid away in the summer. Students see it as giving up their summer after after high school missing graduation parties. I know that's how I looked at it, but um, some of my closest friends in life I met during my bridge program and I may not have made it through union without it because the expectations going to a rural public high school to union college, I had no idea what I was getting myself into and that bridge program was really helpful. I'm glad you touched on that because I think one of the things I've heard in speaking to parents, especially those who didn't go to college themselves is, you know, there's a lot of pride, uh, you know, in, the, in their child going off to college and, and earning this admission and a concern that this could be some type of a remedial experience or, or that their their child isn't worthy. And so I'm glad you touched on yeah. on the reason why they exist and, and what they really are, because I think there's some uh, the potential for some some misunderstanding or stigma if if they're not fully understood. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I deal. I dealt with that this this past summer. We had a lot of students who are like, why are we here? And I'm like. One, that's a question for the admissions office because I'm new, but um, I, I was able to break it down, <laughs> break it down in a way where they, they start to see the value in it. And I'm like, I know you're you're away from home and our, our summer program has historically been more of a boot camp type mentality. And, and I'm going to be working to transition it more to the onboarding experience. But our students were going from seven o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock at night, like nine classes. Like it was very intense. So I think students had a legitimate reason to, to wonder why they had to go through that, um, especially being at Hamilton, where the just to get into the school, you, you have to be impressive academically. So students in our program are super impressive. Um, they may just not, you know, be the strongest writer. They may not um, be the best at math, right? Like, and, and so it's not, it's not remedial. <laughs> most, most programs aren't remedial at all. It's just literally bridging the gap and, and filling in um, to ensure that students are, are successful. So let's transition to that, that first day, you know, let's think about a place like a union, a Hamilton, a WPI, yeah. which is uh, primarily residential. Uh, so you're a parent, uh, you know, you're, you're dropping your daughter off, fast forward, you know, 15 years, <laughs> uh, you know, what, um, what can you expect as a parent that first day and what can, what can your child expect? 
Well, for the parent, expect to cry. Like, I, I'm 15 years away, and I already know I'm going to cry. And hopefully she goes to Hamilton. I'm still working here, so I don't have to pay. But uh, <laughs> but um, it, it, it can be, especially if it's your first child, it, it can be overwhelming. Um, it can be scary. You know, I think there's there's a lot going on in the world. And, and so having your kids close by and knowing that they're safe is 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 nice. And then when you drop your, your kid off at college, like this is the f- really the first step towards adulthood. Yes, your home is their primary residence. Yes, you're, you know, you're still claiming them on your, your taxes. You maybe not getting that child tax credit anymore, but, um, you know, they're, they're still your child, but they're, they're out there. They're making their own decisions. They're responsible for themselves, um, you know, even if you live 15 minutes from the college, like going and getting them in a time of need isn't always the easiest thing. So, so there's a tremendous amount of faith that you have to put into your child and trust that you have raised them um, to be responsible young adults. Um, and they, they've earned that spot at that, that college. They wouldn't have been admitted if the institution didn't think they were right for the institution. So you have to put faith in the work that your child has done and faith in the work that you've done as a parent. Um, and for, for the child, it, it's sort of the same thing. Like this is a lot of students don't think about it this way, but like I said before, nothing will ever be the same again. I think what students don't think about when they're going to college is like life still happens, right? College is hard academically. We know that, but it's hard on students because they're doing all this work academically, but stuff is still happening at home. Grandma's getting sick. The dog is is dying. You know, like there, there's all these different like, and you're and you're missing out. They have younger siblings. They're missing out on that sibling's first steps, or they lost their first. Two. They're they're missing out on some milestones, so that can be really hard. So that's why earlier I said it's really important to to set some ground rules on on what the the communication is going to be like. You don't want to overburden your child with like call me every day, text me after every class. Like that's, they have a, they're going to have enough on their plate. Um, but they need to know that if they need to call you, um, that they, that they absolutely can. And that way, you know, if, if you need to get in touch with them, if they, if they, you know, if you have a code word, like blue Ninja turtle, um, then they know like, okay, this is serious. I got to call my mom. Let me step away from this group project or whatever it is. So I think setting ground rules will, will help, but it, it can be overwhelming. It, it's, it's definitely overwhelming. I'm 15 years away and I'm overwhelmed. So, so um, yeah, be, prepare yourself. So I think one of the things that um, for me as a college student that, that really rocked me was I went from being, you know, top of the class and in, in some of the most rigorous classes to being surrounded by people who were yeah. at least as smart, if not much smarter. Uh, and so <laughs> That's a real challenge and, and can can lead to imposter syndrome, students yeah. feeling like they don't belong, uh, and or students often might feel homesick or they might feel like they made a wrong choice. So yeah. when you're a parent and you get that you get that first call, um, whether it's the imposter syndrome, whether it's homesickness and there's there's self doubt creeping in. As someone who works with students on the other side, Aaron, what is it that you hope that uh, parents are 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 saying? to their yeah. students and, and, and how are they sh- supposed to support their students during those yeah. times? I think you can start by validating what they're feeling. Um, even if you don't necessarily agree with it, I think some older generations come from the mindset of like, suck it up. <laughs> right. And, and I think the generation we're seeing now, Gen Z, like that's not what they need to hear. Like what they're experiencing is very different than what any of us experience. And so I think if we validate and reassure them that like, it's okay to feel this way, um, that can, uh, just hearing that can help alleviate some of that stress. Um, but then, then listen, listen, I think that's what a lot of students are really craving right now is just having someone to listen to. Um, if you feel like what they're struggling with is more than what you are capable of supporting, you know, then, then the conversation is, all right, how can we connect you to the ample resources on a college campus? I think now we're starting to understand like mental health is really important and colleges have mental health resources. They have counseling appointments students can have, but we're also seeing that institutions are overwhelmed with how much mental health support students need. Um, so 
it's really important as students and families when they're making their decision on what college they're going to that they even if like you you're a student who's never had mental health challenges you've never gone to counseling before it's still important to know what those resources are like oh every tuesday is dog therapy day like great we have a pet at home they're gonna miss a dog go to dog therapy on on tuesdays right like know what those resources are as a parent so that you can then point them in the right direction like you're not going to be able to call as a parent and be like my son johnny is da, 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 da. they are they coming in to see like they the counseling center can't tell you that um so it goes back to having that trust and and pointing them in the right direction pointing them to the, the the case managers on campus like every dean of students office nowadays has at least one case manager uh that can help connect students to resources that are on campus um, I think that's that's really important. I think that's for for first gen students. Um, the, those are the the conversations that they oftentimes are missing. Like their their parents, at least for my students, parents are so overwhelmed with just trying to survive, right? Just trying to make it day to day, pay bills, and 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 manage without their oldest child, who was the main communicator for them because English is in their first language and did, was responsible for caring for the younger students or younger children in the family. Um, so, so that's, what's missing. And, and you also, if, if you're a parent that's in that sort of situation, like you don't have to feel guilty because you don't have all the answers, but if you can reassure your student that there are resources available to them on campus and point them in that direction, I think you're, you're doing right by them. And, and, you know, you brought up, uh, mental health and student wellness. Um, you know, if, if, if you're concerned about your child, if maybe they've they've stopped contacting you and not not you know they haven't called in the last two hours, um, yeah. but you know you you really have a concern. Maybe you're starting to see some some red flags, either past behaviors that have have precipitated uh, difficult times or new behaviors that you've never seen and that that are causing some some genuine concern. As a parent, how do you how do you navigate the college bureaucracy? Like who who can you reach out to 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 make sure that uh, you know your your child isn't getting isn't getting lost in the shuffle. Yeah. So depending on your level of concern, right? I think there's different people you can contact. If it's like an immediate emergency, like you are worried for your child's life, campus safety, right? They're the ones who can be dispatched immediately to go find your your, your child. Um, if it's something you're concerned about and you just want to check in, you haven't heard from your kid, you know, you can contact Res Life and they can do a wellness check. Um, if it's something that you're noticing a pattern and you, you, you want some sort of effort made to help connect them to resources on campus, that's when you can contact the Dean of Students Office and that case manager or like Hamilton, we have Sarah Solomon, blessings to her. She is the Associate Dean for Student Support um, and, and she coordinates those efforts on campus. Um, so every college is gonna have a different system in place and all that should be available on the institution's website, usually under the Dean of Students um, website section. Uh, but yeah, if it's, if it's an immediate emergency, like your child is like, I'm over this, and then they don't respond to you, like campus safety, yeah. But also like understand like if you're overreacting um, and you call campus safety on your child, like, and they're fine, they're just stressed for studying, like they'll probably be pretty upset. Um, so again, that's where it goes back to like setting setting those ground rules and those expectations. So everyone understands like, hey, if I don't hear from you for three days, like know that I'm going to call campus safety. So that way, when that happens, they can't be mad. Like this was our this was our expectation. This is what we were we were going to do. Thanks, Aaron. So, uh, you know, one thing that I think we're we're certainly familiar with and, and that um, you know, we see play out year after year is that students who are, are most successful are those who are engaged in the community. So those who have made connections with uh, faculty, staff, peers, even one even one connection in each of those groups can go a long way to, to making people feel a sense of belonging and a sense that there is a, a support network. I mean, for myself, I mentioned, uh, you know, Matt Millis, director of student activities when I was at Union, became a colleague best man in my wedding. Uh, you know, the, some of these relationships can can grow very strong, um, you know, and, and faculty members who, you know, would, would teach my class in the morning and I'd see them at a sporting event in the afternoon supporting uh, students in their class. I think those type of connections are so strong. I'm curious, uh, who were those people for you? Uh, you know, faculty, staff, uh, one or two close peers, and, and how did you develop those relationships? 
Yeah, I was I was blessed that I had really good mentors while I was at Union. Um, I think it, it started with Carolyn Fielder, who was my opportunity program counselor. Um, she, you know, at times was was ragging on me a little bit, but it was all out of love. Um, and she 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 picked my major for me without even realizing it. Like she said right away, you're going to be an American studies major. And I was like, no, I'm I'm biology and I'm going to be a zoologist. And I, then I was going to be econ and I took three econ courses. I was like, I'm going to do sociology. And I settled on American studies. So she knew me better than I knew myself. I also mentioned Lorraine Cox. She was my academic advisor and she actually ended up being the program director of American studies. So it was all kind of fate that worked out. But I had great professors, Kenneth Slaxon, who was my thesis advisor, Melinda Lawson, who I probably took like six classes with her um, and, and went on the civil rights mini term my senior year. Teacher Hill Butler, who was the first black teacher I had had since preschool <laughs> like i so I, she's incredible I, I she was incredible she still is incredible shout out to to deidre um the, the uh gretchel hathaway um was also a huge mentor to to me tim dunn um bless his soul i don't know where he is today but uh he was he was crucial in in my later years of college i had i had so many um i had coaches i had i had a great group of friends that that you're right like having connections to faculty staff and, and peers like you don't have to be friends with everyone you don't have to love every single professor you have but having a, a, a sort of web of support a, a safety net to fall back on when you don't know who to go to for something or you don't even know what to ask for help with um, is really crucial enjoying the podcast like and subscribe to this YouTube video you can also find us on the web at insideadmissionpodcast.com, and you can find and engage with us on social media, where our handle is Inside Admission, on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Now, back to the pod. Aaron, uh, you know, we were just talking about, uh, you know, your own experiences, the people you made uh, connections with, but as a parent, you know, how can you advise uh, your child to be best prepared to to build some of those relationships themselves? How do they engage with a faculty member? You know, how do, how do students, especially in the wake of a pandemic where so much has been restricted and remote, you know, how do you encourage them to get out and, and meet students face-to-face -face and not online? And, and uh, you know, how can they engage with staff? You know, what are some, some tips or strategies? Yeah, so in terms of engaging with, with faculty and, and staff, I think, normalizing asking for help like that it's okay to ask questions i see this all the time students come from high schools where they were the creme de la creme they were the top of the class they were the ones helping to teach other students and now like you mentioned before like they're surrounded by other people who are just as smart as them if not like seem as if they're smarter right like they went to fancy board country day schools and boarding schools. And so their vocabulary is a little bit more in line with college vocabulary than a student from rural upstate New York. Um, it's, it's okay to go to office hours. Like when, when I was at union, this, this is kind of a funny story. When I saw office hours on the syllabus, cause I didn't even know what a syllabus was, right? Like that's another word. That's like, no, we, we just, teachers just gave us our homework in high school. That's, that's it. So when I had the syllabus and said office hours, I'm like, okay, that's when the professor is busy doing work. That is not what office <laughs> hours are. That's not what office hours are. But no one explained this during orientation. Orientation was like, don't do drugs. Don't that's good advice. That's good advice. under the influence. I mean, it's, it's all good advice. Yep. yep. Like as, as a first gen student, it would have been nice to know what a syllabus was or what the bursar was, right? Like, so it's okay to ask questions in class. It's probably terrifying for a lot of students, but raise your hand, to ask questions. You can show up to class early to talk to your professor. You can stay after class to talk to your professor. You can go to office hours. If those office hours conflict with sports practice or work study, you can email your professor. I know, send an email, wild, wild thing. Um, and you can ask them to meet at a time that is more convenient for your schedule. But if you go to office hours with a professor, you're going to realize, wow, this is a human being. Yes, they have their PhD, but they probably want you to refer to them by their first name. Um, that they probably have a lot of similarities. Watch the same kind of TV shows as you or like the same sports teams as you or you have something in common with them. Professors are really good about 
making that that connection so it's not all focused on the, the classroom material when you go to office hours and you start to build that rapport with your professor class is a little less intimidating you're maybe a little bit more vote motivated to to submit that paper on time or, or to put a little bit more effort into editing that paper so you don't sound a little foolish um you might see the professors in the gym. You might be on the elliptical next to them. You might see them in the dining hall. You might play noon hoops basketball with them. Like there's, there's a lot of like, especially at residential schools, professors are a part of the community. Um, and so when you're interacting with them outside the classroom, it makes engaging with them inside the classroom that much easier. Uh, and, and same with staff, right? Uh, you know, the staff, are are hired for a reason we do more than just push papers like we we really like we we want to help no one works in higher ed for the paycheck just gonna throw that out there uh no one works in higher ed for the paycheck and so we're, we're doing this because we're passionate about working with students and if students understand that i think a lot of students are like "Ooh, the administration like god we are human beings um and so we we students need to know that we want to engage with them and and we're there to support them and 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 then in terms of engaging with students this is kind of a cliche answer but every college has hundreds of clubs and if you don't like the clubs we have you can start your own club right like every tour guide has said that in the history of giving tours um and while it's true like that is a great way to get to know students is joining a club that you're interested in, whether you have experience in it or you've never done it before i joined ballroom dancing my sophomore year, um, mostly because I wanted to be a solid dancer at my wedding. We didn't dance at my wedding, um, but I learned how to bachata and merengue and, and tango. And, and it was really cool to, I met people that I'm still friends with to, today. Um, I was really disappointed. They never taught us the thriller dance, but I learned it from YouTube. So it's all good. Um, but like, that's, that's like, I never, if you asked me in high school, are you going to join a ballroom dancing club? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I, I, I joined the Black Student Union. I had a radio show. I, I joined the, the Black Engineers of America Club. I wasn't an engineer by any stretch of the imagination, but they had the best trips. We got to go to Six Flags for free. Like you just, but, but you meet people, right. And, and then those friendships grow outside of the clubs and outside of the classroom. So I think getting involved, um, in those clubs and organizations, but also like when you have, you're in class with people, like talk to them, like ask them to do study groups and, and go to lunch and, 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 you know, a lot of it will happen naturally. Um, you just can't overthink it. And I think a lot of students today overthink it and they, they make their first couple of friends are like, all right, this is my group. And I'm like, eh, you might want to diversify a little bit. So uh, the next time you're back on the podcast, we're going to have you show us how to, salsa merengue so uh <laughs> wear dance shoes so um i, I do want to uh, sort of start to to bring this to a close and, and something that i want to be sort of a hallmark uh you know we have you here as an expert someone who's who's been through this process as a student who's worked at several types of institutions i'm curious if you have one piece of advice uh for students as they approach their transition to college what would that be uh, and then uh, for the parents listening, uh, the same thing. You know, what one piece of advice is is most important for them to hear from you? Yeah. So for for students, it's, it's two things. One, become good at organizing your email. It, it, it it's a simple statement. It's not always simple for students to become good at their email, but you've all had access to email since you were two. So. By 18, you should know how to navigate your email and you're going to be bombarded. But you like you think the college search process, colleges are blowing you up. Just wait until students have access to the everyone listserv. It is out of control. And it's very easy to just let it get blow up out of control. And then you're missing out on really important opportunities, job opportunities, internship opportunities, scholarship opportunities, financial aid deadlines. Like it's really, really colleges are using some platforms to send important messages through text, but the primary mode of communication in higher education at this point in time is email. And so you really have to become good. And there, there's simple things you can do, smart folders and creating rules, like it's, Google it, <laughs> like Google it. It, it. It's really easy to, to do. So, so mastering your email, because guess what? Once you graduate and you have a job, like you're gonna email. 
I mean, they might Slack or have Microsoft Teams or whatnot, but you're you're going to email. Um, my my other piece of advice is be okay with being uncomfortable. I think that's something that you know we we as parents we want to protect our kids and we want that and we want all the best for them and I don't blame any parent for wanting that. Uh, but in doing that, we we kind of shield our students from from feeling uncomfortable and how to navigate feeling uncomfortable. And I think sometimes that can do a disservice to our students. And so when they go to college, as soon as they feel uncomfortable, they, they don't know how how to how to push through it or how to navigate it, how to have challenging conversations. Um, what I've noticed with my first year students just in our summer program, we had we had a big sort of divide among students and I had a whole three hour long dialogue um, that was intentional. And we came to, what came out of it was students didn't know how to have uncomfortable conversations with each other. Not everyone you go to college with is gonna have the same beliefs as you. Not everyone's going to like the same things as you. And some people are, are going to things that do things that upset you. and and your reaction to it is is your reaction uh, but then how do you move forward from that initial reaction how do you engage with people who are different from you um what kind of boundaries do you set like okay like you can have things that are like no i won't i won't engage with this but these are the things i will engage with how how can we move forward how can we make this better so preparing yourself for some of those uncomfortable conversations I think can be really, really helpful, not just in college, but later on in life. Um, for, for parents, uh, um, I think that's like how I they said, feel right now. <laughs> deep sigh. <laughs> deep sigh, deep sigh. I think, like I said earlier, just, just, you know, set, set the, the, the ground rules, expectations on, on how, how the, and that can be revisited Right. Like if you're like, OK, freshman year, like this is our expectation. Sophomore year, things might be different. And that's that's OK. Um, but having sort of an open line of communication and having trust in your student. And if they make a mistake, it's OK. Most of them, like hopefully the mistake's not too huge. But like generally, like it's a learning like that's one of the perks of college is like sort of this bubble where students can make mistakes and learn from them and, and become better from it. Um, so if they struggle, if they get a D in their calc class in the first semester, like don't beat them up over it, like verbally, um, trust that they, they will learn from that mistake and they will better utilize the resources that exist on campus. It can be hard to sort of let, let go, but you can be an engaged parent without sort of micromanaging that, that experience. And, and if, and if they're, they, they, that college that they choose to go to isn't the right one, um, there, there is the, the ability to transfer and there's other routes. Like, I think a lot of people expect like, okay, you go to college, you graduate in four years, you get a job and that's how like college is not a linear path, right? There, there's students take leaves, medical leaves, personal leaves, things happen. I had a student who got pregnant during her sophomore year of college and she was very fortunate that she had a family that supported her and she still graduated. Um, but that's not the norm. Like usually when people get pregnant in college, like they have to take time off from college. So um your your love and support is is one of the biggest pieces to a student's success in college um and so know that even if you're not there with them that that um your support is still very much at the at the core of of their success well thanks aaron i want to thank you for joining us on inside admission and um you know just my my last words uh for the students and parents listening uh and really sort of a, a theme for this podcast is is focus on the things you can control uh, and don't stress about the rest. So thanks again, Aaron. Um, appreciate you taking the time and uh, sharing your wisdom with us. Enjoying the podcast? Like and subscribe to this YouTube video. You can also find us on the web at insideadmissionpodcast.com and you can find and engage with us on social media where our handle is Inside Admission on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook.